are we alone in the universe? It's a question we've been asking since mankind developed language. The idea that aliens may be visiting Earth is an old ponderance. It is important for humans to understand our place in the vast cosmos we inhabit. Are there life forms older than us? And if so, could some of them have visited or be visiting our tiny blue globe? Only recently has evidence come forward that may answer this age-old question. Does physical evidence exist of spacecraft manufactured by a race other than humans? How do we quantify this evidence? Who has it and can we, the inhabitants of Earth, understand it? Many say not only are we not alone, but we have been visited multiple times and by various different races, and their technology has been scattered around our planet many times when their technology, just like ours, fails. All machines fail, no matter how complex or advanced they are. Therefore, it isn't unusual that if aliens are visiting Earth frequently, then they would experience failures of their craft, just as we have airline crashes and train derailments. No machine, no matter how technologically advanced, is perfect. When most people think of a UFO crash, they think of Roswell, New Mexico. However, Roswell is only one of many such occurrences. UFO crash reports have been published since 1884. This early and perhaps the first UFO crash reported in the United States occurred in Max, Nebraska, about 35 miles northwest of Binkelman in Dundee County on the 6th of June. John W. Ellis and three of his herdsmen, as well as a number of other cowboys, were out engaged in a roundup when they were startled by a terrific whirring noise over their heads, and turning their eyes, saw a blazing body falling like a shot to earth. It struck beyond them, being hidden from view by a bank. One of the herdsmen, Alf Williamson, was burned as he approached the craft, which had created a split in the ground as it came to a stop. He was taken back to Ellis' home and treated for his burns. E.W. Rawlins, the brand inspector for the district, came to the location later to inspect it. The Nebraska State Journal reported on the event again in 1887, saying one piece that looked like the blade of a propeller screw of a metal of an appearance like brass, about 16 inches wide, three inches thick, and three and a half feet long, was picked up by a spade. It would not weigh more than five pounds, but appeared as strong and compact as any known metal. A fragment of a wheel with a milled rim, apparently having had a diameter of seven or eight feet, was also picked up. It seemed to be of the same material and had the same remarkable lightness. The description of the material in this case is reminiscent of the Roswell debris regarding its lightness and durability. Yet this crash occurred 63 years before the Roswell incident. Some UFO researchers believe that remnants of the metal from this crash could be lost or buried in the Republican River Valley and that it's possible that in a barn or tool shed there could still be pieces of metal laying around that no one knows where it came from. Perhaps one day someone will discover an unusual fragment from this crash and bring forth physical proof of the existence of alien visitors.
Most UFO researchers agree all roads from UFO crash retrieval incidents lead directly to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio and their Foreign Technology Division. Wright-Patterson's Foreign Technology Laboratories are the final destination for any material recovered from other nations which may have some strategic value to our military. Technology is acquired, then back-engineered to determine how it was made and to glean any useful advances that may further our own technology. Not only is Wright-Patterson the logical destination for UFO material, there are many who say they have seen or know of the existence of alien bodies there as well. In 1947, something crashed in Corona near Roswell, New Mexico. Debris from that crash is reported to have been sent to Wright-Patterson, as well as the bodies of the craft's occupants. No one knows if they are still there today, though it is well known that Wright-Patterson does have long-term cold storage facilities where bodies could be preserved. In his book, The Day After Roswell, Colonel Philip J. Corso claims he stewarded extraterrestrial artifacts recovered from the crash near Roswell. Corso was chief of the Pentagon's Foreign Technology Desk in Army Research and Development in 1961, working under Lieutenant General Arthur Trudeau. Corso says a covert government group was assembled under the leadership of the first director of Central Intelligence, Admiral Roscoe H. Hillencotter, which was called Majestic 12. Among its tasks was to collect all information on off-planet technology. According to Corso, the reverse engineering of these artifacts indirectly led to the development of accelerated particle beam devices fiber optics, lasers, integrated circuit chips, and Kevlar material. In the book, Corso claims the Strategic Defense Initiative, or SDI, Star Wars, was meant to achieve the destructive capability of electronics guidance systems and incoming enemy warheads, as well as the disabling of enemy spacecraft, including those of extraterrestrial origin. Several previous employees and military personnel that have been stationed at Wright-Patterson have come forward and claim there are secret underground facilities there. These facilities are said to have been installed under Hangar 18 and 23 with adjoining tunnels. No one knows how deep or how large the underground system is, but claims persist that intact, even fully functional saucers are housed there. Not only do they have material from crashed UFOs and saucers, rumors persist that the government is also keeping live aliens in special atmospheric chambers within these underground sections. Bodies of dead aliens and chambers with living alien beings secure within the confines of a heavily guarded military airbase in the United States? You may say this is the stuff of science fiction but the government has for decades and continues to keep sinister secrets from the public. Wright-Patterson is just one of many secret locations within the United States that facilities such as this do exist. famous UFO crash would undoubtedly be the Roswell incident. However, nothing crashed at Roswell. The crash occurred about 75 miles away at Corona, New Mexico. The Roswell Air Base was the closest location for the event to be reported and the objects to be ferried to. From there, the UFO crash material was flown to Wright-Patterson in Ohio. Roswell has become synonymous with UFO crash retrievals. Indeed, it is the most investigated case with the most eyewitness reports and deathbed confessions for any UFO incident. Over the years, some of the Roswell information has been proven to be false, 
yet at its core, there are undeniable facts that cannot be ignored. The events of Roswell began on either July 2nd or July 4th when William W. Mack Brazel, a sheep rancher, discovered debris on his ranch after a night of severe thunderstorms. He found the debris to be unusual and had no idea what it could be from. Days later, Brazel brought some of the material to Roswell while on a trip there to look into getting a new truck. He showed the material to the local sheriff who reported it to Jesse Marcel, the intelligence officer at the Roswell Army Air Base. Marcel, with other officers, drove out to the ranch and collected the material. Marcel was familiar with all flight technology the USA possessed, but was clueless as to what the material was or where it came from. Later, the second part of the craft was discovered, a few miles away, and it too was collected. At this point, what happened next depends on who you ask. However, most researchers agree the material was collected, bodies were discovered, and it all was packaged up and sent to Ohio. No one knows where it is today, though many believe the debris is at Wright-Patterson, and the actual hull of the craft is in a secure location in Nevada within the Area 51 test range called S-4. Of course, the government denies any of this happened and maintains no UFOs crashed near Roswell. They claim that the Roswell craft was a basic radar reflective balloon called Project Mogul, and the bodies were simply dummies dropped in the desert in the 1950s. Several witnesses to the Roswell incident beg to differ. Today, there are hundreds of eyewitnesses that have come forward adding more bits and pieces to the Roswell story. A museum has been established dedicated to the incident, and researchers are continuously learning more details, including information that there exists a special military unit whose sole mandate is to recover and deal with crashed UFOs. Long before the X-Files TV series, the Majestic 12 documents arrived. The documents were anonymously sent to TV producer Jamie Shandera's residence in Hollywood, California in December of 1984 in the form of photos on 35mm film. After developing the images, he spent the next few years researching and authenticating them. The documents are a brief about a secret government agency that was created in response to the crash at Roswell. The agency, known as Majestic 12 or MJ-12, would be responsible for handling the UFO extraterrestrial situation in the United States, including, but not limited, to the cleanup of crashed saucers dispensation of alien technology to be back engineered and cover-up of alien visitation evidence. The documents include the first members of the organization. Dated November 18, 1952, they mention the Roswell incident, which happened in 1947. According to these documents, an alien spaceship did indeed crash near Roswell. Its propulsion system was apparently destroyed in the crash, but four alien bodies were recovered from the scene. It was concluded that the ship probably originated from outside our solar system and was probably a short-range craft. The document briefly describes another crash at El Indio, Texas in 1950. The MJ-12 documents were said to be briefing papers for President-elect Eisenhower from briefing officer Admiral Roscoe H. Hillencotter, the first director of the CIA from 1947 to 1950. The documents also list the other members of MJ-12, 
all high-profile figures in the U.S. federal government. The authenticity of the documents has been a hot debate since their public release in 1987 by Shandera, together with partner William Moore, author of The Roswell Incident. Some supporters, such as retired aerospace engineer Robert M. Wood, have spoken publicly in support of these documents, citing forensic evidence. Both the FBI and the Air Force claim that these documents are fakes, citing an Air Force investigation. To make matters more complicated, others, such as an alleged ex-special agent for the U.S. Air Force Office of Special Investigations, Richard Doty, claimed that the MJ-12 documents are part of a large disinformation campaign that lasted decades and were orchestrated by the AFOSI to make UFO researchers believe they were seeing alien technology when in fact the objects studied and observed were secret USA projects. The jury is still out on the truth surrounding these documents and other supporting documents have been leaked since these. The MJ-12 documents may or may not be real, but the existence of a military retrieval unit has been documented and reportedly involved in almost every crash to date. Roswell may have been the most famous UFO crash. It is by far not the only one. Thirteen years after the Nebraska crash of 1884, a UFO crashed into a windmill in Aurora, Texas. The year was 1897, and this was the year of the great airship reports in the United States. As the story goes, it was April 17th, a slow-moving spaceship crashed into a windmill on Judge Proctor's property, bursting into pieces. As the debris was searched through, supposedly, the body of a small alien was discovered. Originally, the alien pilot was dubbed the Martian pilot. Some of the debris also revealed material sketched with a type of hieroglyphic. The town folk gave the poor little creature a proper burial in the local cemetery. In 1973, a living witness to the crash recalled the story and validated the recovery and burial of a little man not of this earth. Reportedly, wreckage from the crash site was dumped into a nearby well located under the damaged windmill, while some ended up with the alien in the grave. Adding to the mystery was the story of Mr. Brawley Oates, who purchased Judge Proctor's property around 1935. Oates cleaned out the debris from the well in order to use it as a water source, but later developed an extreme severe case of arthritis, which he claimed to be the result of contaminated water from the wreckage dumped into the well. As a result, Oates sealed up the well with a concrete slab and placed an outbuilding on top of the slab. MUFON investigated the Aurora Cemetery and uncovered a grave marker that appeared to show a flying saucer of some sort, as well as readings from its metal detector. MUFON asked for permission to exhume the site, but the cemetery association declined. One interesting aspect to the story is that a Mr. T.J. Weems, a United States Signal Service officer, discovered papers on the body that were written in a strange hieroglyphic type script. He assumed it was a journal of the alien's travels. No one can locate these papers today, and it's assumed Mr. Weems took them. Mr. Weems was likely attached to nearby Fort Worth. If so, this could be the first time physical proof of the existence of aliens was returned to a government military base. Is it possible that the government had in its possession metal fragments and alien writings as early as 1897? Is the body of an alien still buried in a small town cemetery in Texas? 
and could any of this material still exist today? One of the most mysterious stories of a crashed UFO with alien bodies preceded the well-known Roswell event by some six years. This case was first brought to investigators by Leo Springfield in his book UFO Crash Retrievals, The Inner Sanctum. He began a tantalizing account of a military-controlled UFO crash retrieval which is still being researched today. The details of the case were sent to him in a letter from Charlotte Mann, who related her minister grandfather's deathbed confession of being summoned to pray over alien crash victims outside of Cape Girardeau, Missouri in the spring of 1941. Reverend William Huffman had been an evangelist for many years, but had taken the resident minister reins of the Red Star Baptist Church in early 1941. Church records corroborate his employment there during the time period. After receiving this call to duty, he was immediately driven the 15-mile journey to some woods outside of town. Upon arriving at the scene of the crash, he saw policemen, fire department personnel, FBI agents, and photographers already mulling around the wreckage. He was soon asked to pray over three dead alien bodies. As he began to take in the activity around the area, his curiosity was first struck by the sight of the craft itself. Expecting a small plane of some type, he was shocked to see that the craft was disc-shaped, and upon looking inside, he saw hieroglyphic-type symbols indecipherable to him. He then was shown the three victims non-human as expected, but small alien bodies with large eyes, hardly a mouth or ears, and hairless. Immediately after performing his duties, he was sworn to secrecy by military personnel who had taken charge of the crash area. He witnessed those warnings being given to others at the scene as well. When he arrived back at his home, he was still in a state of mild shock and could not keep his story from his wife Floyd and his sons. This late night family discussion would spawn the story that Charlotte Mann would hear from her grandmother in 1984 as she lay dying of cancer at Charlotte's home while undergoing radiation therapy. Charlotte was told the story over the span of several days and although Charlotte had heard bits and pieces of this story before, she now wanted the full details. As her grandmother tolerated her last few days on this earth, Charlotte knew it was now or never to find out everything she could before this intriguing story was lost with the death of her grandmother. Other living supporting witnesses included Charlotte Mann's sister, who confirmed her story in a notarized sworn affidavit, and the living brother of the sheriff of 1941, Clarence R. Shade. He does remember hearing the account of the crash, yet does not have any details. And he did recall hearing of a spaceship with little people. There are also fire department records of the date of the crash. The information does confirm the military swearing department members to secrecy, and also the removal of all evidence from the scene by military personnel. Guy Huffman, Charlotte's father, also told the story of the crash and claimed he had in his possession a photograph of the dead alien. A few weeks after the crash, Huffman was apparently given a photo of two men holding one of the corpses found at the scene. Man's father loaned the photo to a friend but never saw it again. He showed the picture to a photographer friend of his, Walter Wayne Fisk. Fisk will neither confirm nor deny the existence of this photograph. What happened to the bodies of these aliens that crashed to Earth six years before Roswell? 
Could the saucer and physical evidence still exist from this crash, and perhaps it's sequestered away in a vault at Wright-Patterson? Famed UFO researcher Raymond Fowler first broke the details of another crash that occurred on May 20th, 1953. Fowler stated that his information came from engineer Fritz Werner, later identified as Arthur G. Stansel. Stansel graduated from Ohio University in 1949 and was first employed by the Air Materiel Command at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Dayton, Ohio as a mechanical engineer on testing Air Force aircraft engines. Dr. Eric Wayne, who was suspected of leading a reverse engineering team on alien craft, headed the installation's division within the Office of Special Studies where Arthur worked. Stansel signed a legal affidavit vouching to the honesty of his testimony, which was released by Ray Fowler in UFO magazine in 1976. He was working for a company that had a government contract at a nuclear site in Nevada. He was summoned by his boss on May 21st of 1953 and sent on a secret assignment. After being flown to Phoenix, Arizona, he was placed on a bus with blacked out windows and taken to a point some four hours drive northwest of the city of Phoenix proper. The location was supposedly near the city of Kingman, Arizona. The bus was full of passengers, none of whom Stansel knew and would not know as they were told not to communicate with each other. Arriving at the secret destination, two military LIDALs illuminated a surreal scene in the late night pre-dawn skies of the desert. The engineer was amazed to see a disc-shaped craft embedded into the sand. Stansel estimated its diameter to be about 30 feet. Military personnel surrounded the aluminum-like craft, which was brought down by either an internal explosion or was hit by military rockets. Stansel's duty was to calculate the speed of the craft, which he did. Afterwards, he began to glean details from some of the other personnel assigned to this off-the-record mission. He was told of a small cabin inside the craft and very small chairs. He did not get to look into the unknown craft himself. He was taken back when he peeked into a nearby medical tent. Inside was the small body of a creature about four feet tall. He asserts that the alien was wearing a type of skull cap and a silver suit. The suit seemed to be seamless. Back on the return trip home, all the members of the assignment were ordered to sign the Official Secrets Act and were warned not to discuss what they had seen with anyone. Before bringing the crash story to other UFO groups, Fowler did a thorough background check on Stansel and was satisfied to his authenticity and personal integrity. There was additional confirmation to the validity of the Arizona crash. Personnel at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base claimed to have been witness to the delivery from a crash site in Arizona. These witnesses claimed to have seen three small bodies packed in dry ice. The beings were reported as being about four feet tall with large heads and brownish skin color. The time of the delivery perfectly coincides with the events put forth by Stansel. Unfortunately, the military personnel could not make their names public. Fowler maintains that several other witnesses have come forward in the years following the incident, but the lack of other facts and other testimony leave the case lacking. It would appear that prior to Roswell and after, UFOs were dropping quite frequently from the skies over America. Is it possible the United States were shooting them down? 
or could something else have been responsible for the failures that downed these craft early in UFO history? After World War II, the Cold War was warming up, and the U.S. military were painfully aware that foreign nations could fly over our airspace and spy on our advancements. UFO sightings were considered a threat in that they could be invaders, or the hysteria created by UFO sightings could mask an invasion from an enemy nation. The U.S. military and the CIA took UFO sightings seriously, and often fighter planes were on standby to scramble if anything unusual was detected by radar. In fact, events did occur that caused the military to panic and order jets to intercept UFOs over American skies. One such event is when UFOs overflew our nation's capital. From July 19th till the 29th, there were several incidents where UFOs flew over or near the capital. Radar confirmed the objects as airliners and fighter pilots chased the UFOs. The objects were seen and tracked on radar multiple times. The sightings of July 26th and 27th also made front page headlines and even led President Harry Truman to personally call Captain Rupert head of Project Blue Book to ask for an explanation of the sightings. Rupert told the president that the sightings may have been caused by a temperature inversion in which a layer of warm, moist air covers a layer of cool, dry air closer to the ground. This condition can cause radar signals to bend and give false returns. However, Rupert at that time had not yet interviewed any of the witnesses or conducted a formal investigation. The White House concern may possibly have resulted in an order to shoot down the UFOs, as reported in various international news service stories on July 29th of 1952. One such story reported that jet pilots have been placed on a 24-hour nationwide alert against the flying saucers, with orders to shoot them down. An Air Force Public Information Officer, Lt. Col. Moncel Monte, confirmed the directive stating that the jets are and have been under orders to investigate unidentified objects and to shoot them down if they can't talk them down. This is not the only case where pilots were ordered to shoot down UFOs. An American fighter pilot, U.S. Airman Milton Torres, flying from an English airbase at the height of the Cold War in 1957, was ordered to open fire on a massive UFO that lit up his radar, according to an account published by Britain's National Archives. The fighter pilot said he was ordered to fire a full salvo of rockets at the UFO, moving erratically over the North Sea, but that at the last minute, the object picked up enormous speed and disappeared. The pilot said he and another airman were scrambled on the night of May 20th, 1957 to intercept an unusual bogey on radars at a Royal Air Force Station at Manston, an airfield at the southeastern tip of England, about 75 miles from central London. This was a flying object with an unusual flight pattern, the pilot said. Ordered to fly at full throttle in cloudy weather, the pilot said he was given the order to fire a volley of 24 rockets at the mysterious object. As he closed in on the object to prepare for combat, the object began to move wildly before fading off his radar. The target gone, the mission was called off, and he returned to base to an odd reception. 
Torres said he was led to a man in civilian clothes who advised him that this would be considered highly classified and that it would not be discussed with anybody, not even his commander. Though we have pilot reports and other stories about airmen who were ordered to shoot down UFOs but were unsuccessful, we have no idea how many successful incidents have occurred. We do, however, have several crashed UFO reports, so it's logical to assume some of those downed UFOs may be the result of completed missions by pilots to shoot down unidentified flying objects. A Russian story has revealed that an Air Force F-16 gunned down a UFO over Saudi Arabia during Desert Storm with five nations trying to cover up the encounter. Colonel Gregor Petrikov, a Russian official, has come forward and says he was one of the first experts at the crash site in a barren desert region 250 miles northeast of Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. The Americans won't admit it was a UFO their plane shot down, but the debris was not any known aircraft. The Saudis were so frightened that they asked American, British, and French investigators to come to the crash site immediately. Petrikov was visiting in Riyadh at the time when he and a small Russian team were able to inspect the wreckage before American forces from Desert Storm arrived. The craft was circular and made of a material never seen before. About a third of it seemed to be missing, possibly blown away by the American missiles. The Saudis wouldn't let them touch anything, but he saw instruments, machinery, and other things that completely baffled them. He said the markings on the instrument panels and dials were not in any language he was familiar with. It seemed to be a relatively small craft, about 15 feet across. There were three chairs, probably for its crew. They were so small that they seemed to have been made for children. Most amazing was the fact that there were no bodies at the crash site, nor did there appear to be an engine in the craft. The American missiles may have scored a direct hit on the engine, causing it to disintegrate but they checked with the Saudi radar technicians who claimed their instruments didn't show anyone ejecting or bailing out of the craft. Search helicopters were all over the area, which is a desert, and they did not spot any survivors in the vicinity of the crash. During interviews with radar technicians, Petrikov was told that the blip identified as the UFO appeared out of nowhere as four F-16s were streaking towards Baghdad. One of the American jets broke from formation and headed for the UFO. The craft started moving southwest away from the jet and the American pilot gave chase. When the F-16 was within three miles, the craft seemed to fire something at the plane but missed. The American then fired two missiles. Both hit the target. There was a terrific explosion and then the crash. When American investigators arrived, Petrikov mentioned he and his team were immediately ordered out of the area and flown back to Riyadh. There were things they didn't want the Russian team to see. The fact that the craft was circular, that there were no survivors, and that it was made of a foreign substance. Petrikov said members of his team were able to sneak pictures without the knowledge of the Saudis or Americans, but he was ordered to turn them over to Russian authorities the next day. Petrikov said American Army engineers gathered up all debris and carted it away for shipment to the United States. Reports from Area 51, Wright-Patterson, and crashed UFO encounters have all mentioned UFO craft seen with huge holes in them or what appears to be blast areas. 
Is it possible that we are shooting down UFOs? And could the government be lying about UFOs posing a threat to our sovereignty? Or could it simply be that we shoot them down to salvage their advanced technology for our own technological advancement? In the late 1980s, at the now famous Area 51 in Nevada, a man came forward who claimed to have worked as a scientist and engineer reverse engineering extraterrestrial technology at a site called S-4. His name is Bob Lazar. He claimed to have passed several tests by U.S. military officials and was warned that should he ever reveal anything, his family would be executed. Lazar stated the space probe on which he worked creates its own gravitational pull and can pull the fabric of space and time toward it. Lazar claimed to have worked in 1988 and 1989 as a physicist at S-4, allegedly located at Papoose Lake southwest of the top secret Area 51 facility near Groom Lake, Nevada. According to Lazar, S-4 serves as a hidden military location for the study and research of extraterrestrial spacecraft or flying saucers using reverse engineering. Lazar claims he saw nine different extraterrestrial vehicles there and has provided detailed information on the mode of propulsion and other technical details of a disc-shaped vehicle he called the Sport Model. He also claims to have been working on the fuel, an element with an atomic number of 115, which allowed the spacecraft to warp space and essentially pull the desired destination toward the ship. This method of travel allegedly enabled alien travelers to cross vast distances with minimal three-dimensional movement. At the time, no one had any knowledge of Element 115, and Lazar's story was considered a hoax. However, Element 115 was discovered by human scientists in 2003, which gave Lazar's story much more credence. Lazar's educational and professional background cannot be either completely verified or refuted, a situation that Lazar and his supporters attribute to government manipulation of records and other deletions of history, specifically done to discredit him and his claims regarding Area 51, S-4, and his other claims regarding alien technology. Lazar said he encountered several flying saucers. He says his first thought was the saucers were secret terrestrial aircraft whose test flights must have been responsible for many UFO reports. On closer examination, and from having been shown multiple briefing documents, Lazar came to the conclusion that the disks were of extraterrestrial origin. Lazar also claims that he was given introductory briefings describing the historical involvement by extraterrestrial beings with this planet for the past 10,000 years. The beings allegedly originate from the first and second planets within the Zeta Reticuli star system and are therefore referred to as Zeta Reticulans, popularly called greys. According to Lazar, these beings were referred to as the kids within the program or as gourds among the personnel. Lazar claims that the S-4 base proper contains nine aircraft hangars built into the side of a mountain range with hangar doors constructed on an angle matching the slope of the mountain. 
The doors to the hangars are camouflaged with natural material to blend in with the side of the mountain and the adjoining desert floor. He claims the site is protected from all ground-based viewing angles by its location within an isolated valley. Inside these hangars are, according to Lazar, the laboratories and scientists studying extraterrestrial spacecraft. In 2015, Dr. Robert Krangel, a physicist and contractor for Los Alamos, the contractor for S-4, came forward and confirmed that Lazar did in fact work at Los Alamos, and he had been in several meetings with him. This was the validation UFO researchers were looking for to confirm Lazar's credentials. Both Lazar and Krangel's projects were compartmentalized Therefore, neither knew what the other was working on. But the fact they were there proves Lazar did have a top secret clearance and did indeed work on secret projects. At this point, the naysayers' arguments fall apart. It's highly likely that at this moment, some scientists somewhere are currently working on UFO craft and back engineering their technology for our government's sole use. The Kecksburg UFO incident occurred on December 9, 1965 at Kecksburg, Pennsylvania. A large, brilliant fireball was seen by thousands in at least six U.S. states and Ontario, Canada. It streaked over the Detroit, Michigan, Windsor, Ontario area, reportedly dropped hot metal debris over Michigan and northern Ohio started some grass fires and caused sonic booms in the Pittsburgh metropolitan area. It was generally assumed and reported by the press to be a meteor after authorities discounted other proposed explanations such as a plane crash, errant missile test, or re-entering satellite debris. However, Eyewitnesses in the small village of Kecksburg, about 30 miles southeast of Pittsburgh, claimed something crashed in the woods. A boy said he saw the object land. His mother saw a wisp of blue smoke arising from the woods and alerted authorities. Another reported feeling a vibration and a thump about the time the object reported landing. Others from Kecksburg, including local volunteer fire department members, reported finding an object in the shape of an acorn and about as large as a Volkswagen Beetle. Writing resembling Egyptian hieroglyphics were also said to be in a band around the base of the object. Witnesses further reported that intense military presence, most notably the United States Army, secured the area ordered civilians out, and then removed an object on a flatbed truck. A reporter and news director for the local radio station WHJB, John Murphy, arrived on the scene of the event before authorities had arrived, in response to several calls to the station from alarmed citizens. He took several photographs and conducted interviews with witnesses. His former wife, Bonnie Missingel, later reported that all but one roll of the film were confiscated by military personnel. WHJB office manager Mabel Meza described one of the pictures. It was very dark and it was with a lot of trees around and everything and I don't know how far away from the site he was but I did see a picture of a sort of cone-like thing. It's the only time I ever saw it. In the following weeks, Murphy became enveloped with the incident and wrote a radio documentary called Object in the Woods, 
featuring his experiences and interviews he had conducted that night. Shortly before the documentary would have aired, he received an unexpected visit at the radio station from two men in black suits identifying themselves as government officials. They requested to speak with him in a back room behind closed doors. The meeting lasted about 30 minutes. A WHJB employee, Linda Foscia, recalled the men confiscating some of Murphy's audio tapes from that night and that no one knows what happened to the remaining photographs. A week after the visit, an agitated Murphy aired a censored version of the documentary, which he claimed in its introduction had to be edited due to some interviewees requesting their statements be removed from the broadcast in fear of getting in trouble with the police and army. The new version contained nothing revealing and did not mention an object at all. Mesa and also Murphy's wife remember the aired documentary was entirely different from what Murphy had originally written. After the airing, Murphy became uncharacteristically despondent and completely stopped all investigation on the case and refused to talk to anyone about it again and never gave clear reasons why. In February 1969, Murphy was struck and killed by an unidentified car and an apparent hit-and-run while crossing a road. The hit-and-run occurred near Ventura, California, while Murphy was on vacation, and it occurred under mysterious circumstances. How far will the government go to hide UFO crashes? Was Murphy later silenced out of fear he may begin to talk again about the crash? Who were those mysterious men in black suits? And where is the Kecksburg craft today? The fact that UFOs crash seems to indicate that they have vulnerabilities. Many speculate that they may use interdimensional corridors to get to Earth or travel faster than light, but those advanced propulsion systems appear to be capable of failure once in the physical realm. The extraterrestrials who fly these craft may also be vulnerable, just as our pilots can make mistakes that result in a downed aircraft. There can be a multitude of reasons why UFOs crash, including being shot down by our missiles and lesser technology. It's also possible that extraterrestrials allow their technology to fall into our hands, perhaps only to see what we may do with it. No matter the reasons, UFO and advanced technology does appear to be available to our scientists from a variety of crashes and landings since the late 1800s. One location where UFO technology may be used for our advancement is at the Lockheed Skunk Works in California where our stealth aircraft were developed. Ben Rich, the Lockheed Skunk Works director, admitted in his deathbed confession that extraterrestrial UFO visitors are real and the US military travels to the stars. He revealed the information before his death in January 1995. His statements helped to give credence to reports that the US military has been flying vehicles that mimic alien craft. We already have the means to travel among the stars. But those technologies are locked up in black budget projects and it would take an act of God to ever get them out to benefit humanity. Anything you can imagine, we already know how to do. We now have the technology to take E.T. home. No, it won't take someone's lifetime to do it. There is an error in the equations. We know what it is. We now have the capability to travel to the stars. 
When Rich was asked how UFO propulsion worked, he said, let me ask you, how does ESP work? The questioner responded with, all points in time and space are connected. Rich then said, that's how it works. Dr. Ben R. Rich, former Lockheed Skunk Works director, also confirmed there are two types of UFOs, the ones we build and the ones they build. We learned from both crash retrievals and actual hand-me-downs. The government knew and until 1969 took an active hand in the administration of that information. After 1969, the administration handled by an international board of directors in the private sector. Nearly all biometric aerospace designs were inspired by the Roswell spacecraft. From Kelly's SR-71 Blackbird onward to today's drones, UCAVs, and aerospace craft. It was Ben Rich's opinion that the public should not be told about UFOs and extraterrestrials. One cannot get a more decisive statement from a high-profile military development organization than the director of Skunk Works. These statements were made in 1995. Imagine the developments that have occurred since then. Do we have the technology now to travel to the stars? Who controls this technology and will it ever be available to the common man? Will our government ever release this knowledge or are we waiting for aliens to make direct contact and all will be revealed? Over the years, government and military personnel have come forward and described their involvement with crashed UFOs in their retrievals. Another military officer to claim he was part of a retrieval unit is Clifford Stone. Staff Sergeant Clifford Stone served in the U.S. Army for a 22-year period from 1969 to 1990. He claims that he was recruited into an elite UFO retrieval team due to his natural ability to telepathically communicate with extraterrestrial biological entities, or the government's designation of aliens, EBEs. He claims that he was picked out during his childhood by the U.S. military and had an Air Force captain regularly visit him on a weekly basis, who encouraged Stone to pursue his interest in UFOs and eventually influenced his decision to join the military. Upon joining the Army, Stone found himself starting a very untypical military career in a highly classified project he subsequently learned was called Project Moondust. Stone says he was initially given training in nuclear, biological, and chemical warfare at Fort McCallum, Alabama, and then given regular Army assignments until called away to perform his UFO crash retrieval duties when required. A mysterious colonel was the individual who supervised Stone while performing his covert duties. Stone claims that when required for UFO retrievals, he was typically called out for temporary duty to serve between three days to a week. But in some international cases, these could take longer than a month. His Army service record refers to him only performing clerical duties as a typist and has no reference to his alleged training for or assignments with UFO crash retrieval teams. Some support for Stone's claims of having worked in covert UFO retrieval projects is extensive documentation Stone uncovered to support the existence of classified UFO crash retrieval teams associated with Project Moon Dust and of crash retrieval operations in various countries. 
Stone began in the late 1970s to use Freedom of Information Act requests to uncover information disclosing the existence of Project Moon Dust that was created to recover debris of UFOs. In addition, Stone's military service was characterized by his determination to disclose UFO information, even though this was highly unusual for someone engaged in full-time military service. His efforts were not viewed favorably and even opposed by his army supervisors. Stone claims that during his first recovery operation for Project Moondust in 1969, he was assigned to guard a captured EBE. The EBE revealed to Stone during their telepathic communication that it felt fear and intended to escape. In order to ensure the EBE's safety, Stone decided to help the ET escape. Stone cut through a fence and allowed the creature to escape where it was retrieved by a UFO outside the airbase where it was kept. Though he was censored and punished for helping the alien, he was allowed to continue his duties as an interface for ETs. If any of Clifford Stone's claims are true, then there does exist an organization outside of the military and congressional chain of command that frequently works with UFO aliens and apparently they have a broad reach to keep it secret. Could the government have captured aliens held against their will on military installations around America and abroad? What have we learned from them and will we ever be told the truth about aliens on Earth? As early as the late 1800s, we have known about aliens, their craft, and perhaps even their purpose for coming to the Earth. Slowly over time, we have accumulated several craft, various technology, and even the bodies of occupants of UFOs, some apparently captured live and perhaps still living today. This may sound extraordinary, but there exists physical evidence of the truth to many of these claims. There exist today specially designed military units whose sole purpose is to arrive at a crash site early, contain the area, capture any living aliens, and gather up any dead aliens along with their technology. Then transport the craft and debris to secret installations far away from the prying eyes of American citizens. We may never know the full extent of this massive cover-up, much less be allowed to view this evidence. However, nothing can remain a secret forever. As more people come forward and expose the truth about UFO crashes and their containment, the day could come where someone blows the lid off these atrocities and the truth is revealed for all.